In the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel, we have a dramatic scene where the two brothers, James and John, two of Jesus' key followers and disciples, come to him with a question. They want to sit one at his right hand and one at his left when he's there in his glory. What are they thinking? They are thinking, we're on the way to Jerusalem. Jesus is obviously going to be king, that's quite clear. Jesus will need perhaps a home secretary and a foreign secretary or whatever it is. And guess what? We will be able to do those jobs very nicely. Thank you. And Jesus says to them, you have no idea what you're talking about. And actually, when we read on in Mark, we find out what he means. Because when Jesus is finally enthroned with the words King of the Jews above his head, there is somebody on his right and somebody on his left. But they are not doing the kinds of things that James and John imagined. They are suffering the same fate of crucifixion that Jesus himself is going to suffer. So then Jesus says, having said to the brothers, you're talking through your hat, you just, you just don't know what you're talking about. He then calls the other disciples, who were a bit knocked by James and John and this request, and he says, listen, the rulers of the Gentiles do it one way, we're going to do it the other way. What he actually says is, you know how it is in the pagan nations, think how their so-called rulers act. They lord it over their subjects. The high and mighty ones boss the rest around. That's not how it's going to be with you. Anyone who wants to be great among you must be your servant, and anyone who wants to be first must become everyone's slave. And then he goes on, don't you see, the Son of Man didn't come to be waited on, he came to be the servant, to give his life as a ransom for many. And that whole passage, not just the last line, is one of the great clues to what Mark thinks is going on as Jesus goes to the cross. And it's a clue that we can cling on to as we make our way through Lent towards Holy Week and then the awesome moment when Jesus is actually crucified. Because what we have here is not just a theory about how the cross, as it were, enables us to be saved, though that's right there at the heart. That is within this larger agenda of the standing on its head of the world's way of power. As I said in the first talk in this series, what's going on when Jesus announces that God is becoming king is that this isn't going to happen the way that people assume. People imagine that if God is going to take charge, he's going to send in the tanks and clean the place out and drive out wicked doers and replace it with some form of justice which will be quite clear and obvious for all. Well, God does have a passion for justice, but the way to that justice is not by bullying and bossing and forcing people to do stuff, but by the way of the servant. What we have here is what in the trade we call atonement theology, the question of how people get saved as a result of the cross, nested within the redefinition of power within, if you like, Jesus' view of political theology. This is hard for us to get our heads around because often we have separated those things out. How we get saved is over there, how we do politics is over there. It's not like that in the New Testament because it wasn't like that, of course, in the first century as it hasn't been for most of world history. But it's because of this combination and other things that crowd in as well if we're reading Mark with our eyes and ears open that we actually find it quite difficult often uh, to take in the full sweep and scope of what Mark was trying to say in explaining Jesus' death. But having dealt with James and John on that occasion, maybe we should pull back a bit and see how the gospel works to lead us to this point. Mark's gospel is actually very easy in its structure. The first eight chapters are really all about who is Jesus, and that reaches its climax when Peter says at Caesarea Philippi in chapter 8, you are the Messiah, you're the one, you're the king. God is sending you to lead his people in the way he always intended. But then immediately Jesus goes on to talk about the fact that they're going up to Jerusalem and the disciples are thinking, yes, yes, this is right. If you're the Messiah, you've got to lead us to victory. You're going to be king and we'll get rid of these evil, wicked pagans once and for all. But Jesus has a different battle and a different sort of victory in mind. And this is something the disciples couldn't understand. They went on not understanding it all the way through. Just as, to be honest, we often don't understand it to this day. God is going to become king through the death of of Jesus. How does that work? 
Jesus sends us back in that line that he said to James and John and the others, the Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many, as so often the roots of what Jesus meant are deep in the Old Testament, in Daniel, yes, and also in the prophet Isaiah, this time chapter 53, talking about the servant of the Lord who is wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities, so that through his death we, not only Israel but also the whole world, can be free of all the evil that has got into our very bones and into our systems and structures. Isaiah 40 to 55, that's another passage worth reading through at a single sitting, by the way. Isaiah 40 to 55 is all about God becoming king of the whole world, transforming the whole creation. How is this done? Through the work of the servant. Jesus, it seems, has plugged right into that vision, and Mark draws it out in this way. The cross and the kingdom go together. It isn't that Jesus started doing the kingdom stuff and then decided to go to the cross after all. The shadow of the cross actually falls right over the early chapters in the gospel, as well as when we get on to the later part. And so when Jesus then comes to Jerusalem, it's quite clear that something extraordinary, something enormous and momentous is about to happen. And he comes in not on a warrior horse, but riding on a donkey, again picking up an Old Testament passage, the passage from Zechariah, in which the king comes bringing a message of peace. But the people don't want it, and particularly the temple and the temple hierarchy don't want it. They have carved up the world in their own way. They're quite happy with that, thank you very much. And Jesus comes and acts dramatically in the temple, throwing the traders out. And Mark is quite clear what that's all about. For Mark, it is a sign, a parable, a symbol that the temple is going to be destroyed. The place where the living God is going to live with and in and amongst his people, loving them and forgiving them, is not in this building of bricks and mortar and hewn stone and carved wood. It is in and as a person, Jesus of Nazareth. And that temple theology we often miss out, but it's crucial to what Mark is trying to tell us about the meaning of Jesus' death. And so immediately after that, they quiz Jesus. Why are you doing this? Who do you think you are? What right have you got to do that kind of thing? And Jesus tells a story about a man who had a vineyard and sent servants to get the fruit and, and, and the, the tenants of the vineyard beat them and killed them and so on. And finally, he sent his beloved son and they killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. This is the end of the awful story. Everything is gonna be different as a result of this. And they get the message, something is going on here to do with the death of Jesus himself, but this will mean a great transformation in the way that God now runs the world. So Jesus takes his followers off to the upper room and he gives them this symbol, this sign, he didn't give them a theory about what his death would mean. He gave them a meal, and it's as they eat that meal, and as we do now, that we not only understand it, but it goes beyond understanding into participation in what Jesus did on the cross. And so the trial sequence unwinds before Caiaphas and then briefly before Pilate. And Jesus is recognized paradoxically, when Caiaphas says, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed? And Jesus again quotes not only Daniel, but also one of the Psalms to say, yes, and this is the fulfillment of God's saving purpose. And so we come to the foot of the cross. And if we've got Mark in our heads and our hearts, we need to realize that here we are at the moment when history turns its great corner. History has come to the darkest point possible, the point where even the living God incarnate in the person of his son goes to the place of death and darkness in order that the world may be healed, in order that power may be transformed, in order that God may become king on earth as in heaven, but also in the hearts and lives of all those who are prepared to stay at the foot of the cross and, like the centurion, say, truly, this man was the Son of God.